Blockchain, crypto, Web 3.0, whatever you want to call it, holds limitless potential to completely change how we use the internet. We're talking about a technology that's growing twice as fast as the internet was in about 1997-98 at the same number of users, and doesn't look like it's slowing down anytime soon. But there's a huge problem. The space is really complex. A lot of people are super overwhelmed by the steep learning curve as they try to jump in. But that's exactly what I've created this YouTube channel for, is to help you, you know, overcome that learning curve a lot faster by distilling these concepts down so that they're simple. And I put together a free masterclass in this video to talk about some of the hottest topics topics like Web 3.0, Metaverse, crypto gaming, crypto social networks, so that you can understand each of these. And I put timestamps down below so that you can conveniently navigate to each of these sections. This is a compilation of some of the previous discussions that I've had on this channel about these topics, but I've put together everything in this one video so that you can, you know, share with your friends so they can understand how this stuff works. So you can bookmark it, rewatch it later, turn it on for a long drive or something like that. Because if you want to understand exactly where this space is headed, then you need to watch this. I think you're going to get a lot out of it. So if you're new around here, hey, I'm Gregory, and on this channel, I turn you into a blockchain master. So if that's something that you're interested in, then smash that like button down below for the YouTube algorithm and subscribe to this channel. And if you want to learn how to master blockchain step-by-step step, start to finish, then head on over to dappuniversity.com forward slash bootcamp to get started today. What exactly is Web 3.0 concretely broken down into layman's terms? How does it change the internet? And what are some examples of Web 3.0 applications that are being used right now and ones that are coming out in the future? You know, from a really high level, what is Web 3.0? Well, essentially, it's an internet powered by blockchains. And it's an internet that wasn't really possible before all the benefits that blockchains provide, like an internet of value, decentralization, trust minimization, and permissionlessness. And I know a lot of those sound like big, fancy words that you may not understand at first glance, but these are really critical, you know, characteristics that actually allow Web 3.0 to create new business models and kind of reinvent how the internet works, which will be evident as I talk about those things in this video. And so what are some really simple examples of things that you can do with Web 3.0 that you couldn't do, you know, with other previous versions of the internet? Well, a pretty easy example is, you know, cryptocurrency and decentralized finance. So let's just start off with cryptocurrency. So this is actually creating a form of money that is native to the internet, okay? And you couldn't exactly do that uh, with the internet before we had blockchains because one big characteristic of maybe Web 2.0, for example, is an internet powered by databases, you know, siloed databases that live on somebody's central server. And the last thing you want to do is give somebody who owns a central server the power to create a money because they could manipulate, you know, the money supply or your, you know, your own balance, however they see fit, because they have complete control over that. Well, if you have a Web 3.0 blockchain powered internet, then people actually share copies of the code and all the data across multiple computers where it can't be manipulated. So that's an example of decentralization, an example of the internet of value, this trust minimization that I'm talking about. But taking that to the next level, we have permissionlessness, which is the other, one of the other things that I said. And you see that play out in decentralized finance, where take this to the next level, where you have not only just cryptocurrency, but things that you can do with cryptocurrency that you would normally do in the regular financial world, and also new things, things like trade cryptocurrencies. You can do this in a permissionless way. You don't have to ask anybody permission to get on a decentralized exchange or a deck to trade and you don't have to provide your identity information which essentially retains more of your privacy which is something that you completely give up in web 2.0 now these are two common examples of apps that exist right now you know crypto and DeFi are examples of web 3.0 use cases but the possibilities extend way beyond what you can just do with money and I want to talk about those more and how this actually turns the business model of the internet upside down and how it iterates on Web 2.0 and to usher in Web 3.0, what that looks like compared to other previous versions of the internet. So to do that, let's just do a quick recap of all the previous versions of the internet, how they're like one another, how they're different from one another, and then how Web 3.0 comes into the equation. So let's start off with Web 1.0. So Web 1.0 really starts off as the first version of the internet, primarily categorized by just static websites that don't really do very much besides just display information on the page, right? You can go to a website, um, it's got, you know, some, some text on it, some pictures, a cool design, maybe a hit counter. You might be able to email that website around. Maybe that's how you find it about new websites. And we start to see search engines really start to hit the scene. Now transition to more Web 2.0, where you have a much more sophisticated user experience on the internet, 
that creates new possibilities where you have actual web applications where you're signing up with a username and a password, where you start to be able to actually access the internet on a mobile device. You see social networking start to absolutely explode. E-commerce takes off like a rocket ship and tons of new business models completely, you know, come onto the scene and, and change the world really forever. And so as Web 2.0 hits the scene, it, it really changes how the business models of the internet work. So I want to show you this because this is really important to understand so that you can, you know, grasp how Web 3.0 changes things. So let's take an example of social networking. Okay, so the, the, in, the business models for Web 3.0 are essentially that in many cases, you're getting something free and in turn, they're getting information from you and they're just selling that information. They're extracting value from you in many cases where you don't actually know it. And this can be disrupted by Web 3.0 and I'll explain that here in a second. So let's just look at an example of social networking. So we'll take Facebook as an example. So let's say, you know, a user signs up for Facebook. Okay. Well, their incentive to do this is so that they can, you know, network with other people, use this really actually amazing application that's taken an insane amount of money to develop and grow to the point that it has today. OK, and the more users that actually use the network, the more valuable it becomes. But Facebook's got to pay the bills somehow. And so how do they do it if you're largely using the application for free? Well, it's because they you know, are monetizing your information. So basically, whenever you sign up for Facebook, you give them a username and password. You know, they track you everywhere online. So you get a cookie back on your computer. So anytime that, you know, you visit an e-commerce website, you visit a news website, you know, any all your browsing history, they're basically, you know, capturing all that data with a website because all these websites also have Facebook pixels installed on their sites because their incentive is they actually want to pay, you know, to run ads so they can get their customers back off Facebook. All right, back onto their websites. And so you're tracked pretty much everywhere online. And so, you know, at the end of the day, like, you know, Facebook knows a lot about you based upon all your browsing history. And they're getting more and more sophisticated as time goes on at actually generating more insights about you that you don't even realize that you're giving to them. And they're making an absolute killing, all right, off of you because they're selling this information to advertisers who want to spend on their platform and also probably selling it to people off their platform as well. And that right there is one of the most popular, you know, business models for Web 2.0 as it exists today. Give away something for free in turn for information. And in many cases, people who are, you know, charging money for services in Web 2.0 models are also collecting information because why wouldn't they do that anyway? People are clearly fine with it. We'll just make extra money that way too. So the problem with this business model is very extractive. It just takes something from your users. I mean, you're giving them some value by giving them the product for free, but you're just making an absolute killing off of them without any money really going back to the users for using it. Web 3.0 can be different in the sense where, um, you know, as users use the thing itself, then they can reap the monetary benefits for doing so. And they actually, you know, are incentivized to help grow the networks because as the networks gain more network effect, the more people use it, the more valuable the protocols um, and applications become, and they're financially rewarded for doing this. And then the people that they help bring into the network are also financially rewarded for doing this. This is positive sum, and it really benefits everybody, you know, who's a part of this. I and mean, that's fundamentally how every single token-based community works in cryptocurrency right now. You know, the more people hold the token, the more valuable it can become. And the people who are, you know, really strong in that community are financially rewarded for bringing more people in. And those people can also be financially rewarded too. Now, not a lot of people will instantly say, hey, that sounds like a Ponzi scheme. I mean, there will be some things that masquerade as Web 3.0 that are just straight up Ponzi schemes. But I'd also push back and say, OK, so what do you call this model here where Facebook is just getting rewarded for the more people that, you know, bring in the platform based on, you know, their different incentives here. They're just misaligned. And I don't think it's quite fair to just call every single Web 3.0 application a Ponzi. And so if you want an example of that, you know, an application that can uh, actually reward people who are using it in a very positive some way that doesn't just look like a straight up Ponzi where it's like completely rewarding people who got in early and not so much people who got in at the end, then let's look at this example here. Um, this isn't a complete Web 3.0 application yet, but it's a glimpse into what could be possible with Web 3.0 with this new paradigm. So this is from Raul Pal here. He's a founder and CEO of Real Vision Finance, has been a really forward thinking person in this space with a ton of amazing calls and a really impressive track record. But let's look at what they're actually doing over Real Vision Finance by community sourcing information. So he's saying he's watching his fascination as the hive mind of Real Vision bot crypto portfolio based on community only weightings. 
So it's consistently outperformed the market. So his view is that community is smarter than any individual as we all have access to quality information. He says the same thing happened with the Real Vision macro portfolio. And he says he has a strongly held view that the traditional view of markets, you know, giving your money to experts has now changed to together we are experts as the movement towards Web 3.0 and communities with open access to information has super empowered community decision making. This trend has only started, but it's going to totally upend decision making hierarchies, not just in finance, but also many business models overall. It's the early days yet, but this trend is the beginning of even more disruption. So combining communities with AI and giving information back to the community in order to enable better decision making is powerful and the antithesis of the extractive business models of existing platforms that use AI to monetize your attention. Just like I was talking about social media. So this is an example of something that is very positive sum. Of course, the more people use it, the more valuable it becomes, but it, it can pretty evenly benefit everybody who is you know, participate. Of course, people got in earlier. Of course, time in market always beats time in the market. So if you got in earlier to these insights, you're getting rewarded more from the person after it. But the whole point is you don't really need this person later to get a fundamental value as an early adopter. It gets more valuable as more people come in, but they're not necessary in order for the long-term value to increase. And of course, you know, this is not directly paying people out who are using the application in a very automated way. So it's not like truly Web 3.0 in this sense, but it's a glimpse to what's possible with Web 3.0 and these positive sum business models. And eventually this can actually be automated away with blockchain. And if you want a final sort of summary or recap of like what I'm talking about here of, of Web 3.0, what it is and why it matters, then definitely check out this tweet thread here from Chris Dixon where he's saying, you know, Web 1.0, roughly 1990 to 2005, was about open protocols that were decentralized and community governed. So most of the value accrued to the edges of the network, the users and the builders. So Web 2.0, roughly 2005 to 20. 2020 was about siloed centralized services run by corporations. Most of the value accrued to a handful of companies like Google, Apple, Amazon, and Facebook. So we are now at the beginning of the Web3 era, which combines the decentralized community governed ethos of Web1 of Web with the advanced modern functionality of Web2. So Web3 is an internet owned by builders and users orchestrated with tokens. So he's saying centralized platforms follow a predictable life cycle. At first, they do everything they can to recruit users and third parties complements like creators, developers, and businesses. They do this to strengthen the network effect as platforms move up the adoption S-curve, their power over users and third parties steadily grows. So when they hit the top of the S-curve, their relationship with network participants change from positive sum to zero sum. To continue growing requires extracting data from users and competing with former partners. So famous examples of this are Microsoft versus Netscape, Google versus Yelp, Facebook versus Zynga, Twitter versus third party clients, and Epic versus Apple. For third parties, the transition from cooperation to competition feels like a bait and switch. Which, over time, the best entrepreneurs, developers, and investors have learned not to build on top of centralized platforms. This is stifled innovation. So say now let's talk about Web3. And Web3 ownership and control is decentralized. Users and builders can own pieces of the internet services by owning tokens, both non-fungible and fungible. Tokens give users property rights, the ability to own a piece of the internet. NFTs give users the ability to own objects, which can be art, photos, code, music, text, etc., etc. And basically saying all this is, exists on top of blockchain and all this is, you know, a, a future powered by blockchains that was not possible in Web 2.0 without these critical technologies. And we're just scratching the surface of what's possible with this and the next decade is likely to be very bright and very fruitful for people who understand this stuff early and that's one of the reasons I want to help make these YouTube videos so that you all can catch this during this critical time. There's a lot of buzz going around the internet right now about the metaverse and what a big deal this could be for you know the internet, blockchain technology, cryptocurrency over the next coming months and years. Facebook has actually rebranded itself to be called Meta to focus on the metaverse. Well, we saw news about this early this year. I was making you know videos about this in my my channel, how Mark Zuckerberg was saying that they were going to pivot the vision of Facebook itself from a social media company to a metaverse company long term. And after several months, that actually came true. And we just saw a keynote come out recently where Facebook announced this change. Now, just for clarification, uh, face when I say Facebook has changed its name to Meta, it's the parent company that owns the Facebook social media app that you use. So if you're using like Facebook, the app, it should still be called Facebook. But the parent company that owns, you know, Facebook, Oculus, Instagram, that's being rebranded to Meta to focus on the metaverse. And so that's a pretty significant deal. 
Okay, because I mean, Facebook is a massive giant, and they decide they're going to completely scrap their old strategy and start focusing on this. Then I would personally be paying attention to that technology. And I think this change is actually a pretty big reason why we've seen con- crypto markets continue to do well. I think you know investors are trying to allocate capital in areas where there's activity and more use cases. And now, as metaverse has come into the equation, it's another reason why people will be using blockchains in the first place. All right. So with all that being said, like. What is the metaverse? Well, you can think about it as an embodied internet, all right? So a next generation of your internet experience that you see today, okay? So you can think about, you know, internet that you see now where maybe you're using it, this video, like on a website like YouTube, maybe in an app, or you get on social media, you use an e-commerce site, whatever. Well, the internet is really a 2D experience, all right? But in the metaverse, this takes it to a three-dimensional experience. So you can think about technologies like virtual reality, maybe where you have a headset on and you're like fully immersed in a different world, or augmented reality where you can actually see the world around you but then you bring some sort of digital experience to the physical world around you that you can see and hear. Now, you might say, well, we already have that stuff right now. What, what's that got to do with the metaverse? Well, the real critical change here is that the metaverse is actually a different space altogether that's not controlled by any central company. And this is what's made possible by blockchain technology. This is the missing link that makes an open internet where you can do things like, you know, own property or own digital assets that aren't in under anybody's central control, but you can actually take these things and move them around and transfer ownership freely inside this embodied internet experience. And so really, this is a continuation of also what's called Web 3.0. So you might have heard this as a trend in and of itself. So Web 3.0 is the next generation of the internet, you know, things like moving from Web 1.0 to 2.0 to 3.0. Metaverse actually is a subset of Web 3.0, just like, you know, mobile was a subset of Web 2.0. It's just a new way to experience the internet. But the fundamental value proposition of Web 3.0 is an open and decentralized internet powered by blockchains, and you get that with Metaverse. All right, so let's actually go over some concrete examples of what the Metaverse might look like. You know, this is a brand new technology, and we're just scratching the surface for what's even possible. So nobody really knows for sure the extent to which we're going to actually create things and use things in the Metaverse. But let's look at some examples that you could do now and like how, how it work. Okay, so one really simple example is just virtual worlds and everything you can do inside virtual worlds. Okay, so one project that's focusing on this is Decentraland. You know, they're a project that's been around for quite some time. Okay, so you know, a virtual world is kind of a fundamental characteristic of an embodied internet because there's so much that you can do inside of it. You can own land inside the metaverse, okay? This is powered by NFT technology or non-fungible tokens where basically, you know, the NFT just resemb- you know, represents digital real estate. Of course, this could be applied to physical real estate uh, on down the road and so far as we get regulations that actually allow for that type of thing. But virtual worlds are, are, you know, one of the first ways that we could actually make real use cases with metaverse. And right now we're seeing a simple buying and selling of land, you know, doing things on the metaverse worlds, maybe like displaying your NFTs inside an art gallery. And those are really just some beginning use cases that show what's, you know, possible with technology, almost like a proof of concept. And some people like won't even take this seriously because they say like, hey, who really cares? Like, why do I want to just buy some NFTs and some land and sign some big global internet video game? Well, you kind of have to turn that thinking upside down because that's what a lot of early blockchain technology looked like. I mean, and also early internet technology, almost all new technology looks kind of like a toy, but you have to learn how to see what the future potential is here. Because trust me, I was around in 2017 when DeFi and NFTs were really just a concept inside people's heads. And now they've exploded to the massive trends that they are today and aren't going to slow down anytime soon. And so you have to see the same type of thing with metaverse, okay? So just because you can buy land and like look at NFTs inside art galleries right now, these virtual worlds can get better where you could actually do things and, you know, be yourself inside of a metaverse virtual world. So for example, what if you could, you know, take calls inside of a metaverse, like, you know, actually meet people, interact with them to where like instead of seeing somebody on a Zoom call, you could actually have some sort of 3D experience with that person, you know, inside the metaverse. Or what if you could do it where you could basically choose your own physical appearance in the metaverse? And I think that's actually a draw that plays upon a continuation of what you're seeing on the internet now. I mean, how many times do you look at somebody's profile picture on the internet and it doesn't really look anything like them because they're kind of creating themselves their own image? Same thing is true with the NFT avatar trend. A lot of people like to have their NFT rather than their own picture in the first place anyway. And that trend can even continue on into the metaverse. So it, it really plays off that desire. And so, you know, you 
know, I also say, well, hey, nobody's going to sit here like live inside of a VR headset all day. I mean, to counter that, I think some people will. But I think for most people, they don't want to just stay patched in all day, every day. But you can still have an experience where you're sort of in and out of this metaverse and the physical world. And also, don't forget, it's not just about virtual reality with goggles on. You could also have this with augmented reality, too, where you can take, you know, metaverse items and actually interact with them or experience them you know, combine with the physical world around you right now. So we saw this with D-Race for a while, where basically like the horses that you got are D-Race with the NFTs. You could like see them in different places in real time. But other than just the use case of crypto collectibles, there are ways in which, you know, augmented reality could actually be integrated with the metaverse and your physical world to provide you some real benefits. So what happens when basically like some physical items start getting 3D printed and now you have like app stores that exist in Web 3.0, blockchain, metaverse, where basically, you know, you have augmented reality. Let's say you want to print like a side table with some 3D printer at your house. You shop for it like inside of a metaverse. You can go see it. But then like an augmented reality, you can see how it looks in your home and you could actually, you know, print this thing. Now, I know you could just do that now without blockchain, but what happens when like intellectual property for these types of things becomes tokenized? Where now basically what you're doing is just buying the IP to print it and that gets automated away with like, you know, different web 3.0 and metaverse marketplaces there's just so many ways about how we could use this technology that we're really just scratching the surface of what you can do now and the last thing i'll say about this with the metaverse is that it's actually really important for the metaverse to be neutral okay or at least the infrastructure of the metaverse to be neutral i know this is pretty controversial with facebook talking about getting into uh you know the metaverse because people say hey you know Facebook is kind of the antithesis of crypto. They're very centralized. They're sort of just jumping in, trying to control this trend early. To which I say, well, there's not a whole lot you can really do about that other than build a compelling alternative. And I think part of that compelling art alternative is actually neutrality. And that's still, even with Facebook's involvement in this future, that I still think it can be a net positive for this entire movement. Because even if, you know, what they end up creating is not in the spirit of what most people want, who are already here in blockchain and, you know, value the values of, you know, trustlessness, decentralization, centralized persistence, then even if a major player like that comes to space, it isn't you know, maybe compromising some of those things, they still have a ton of people that they can bring into the space that can go down the rabbit hole and actually arrive at that sweet spot of having, you know, similar values to what we have now. Because it only takes a few experiences, you know, where you really feel the pain of centralization to really make you want decentralization. And like I was saying before, the biggest thing that we can do is create compelling alternatives. And we have some of those things now, and they are getting better over time as, you know, Web 3.0 blockchains become more scalable, faster and cheaper to use. And so really, we're just scratching the surface, and I'm excited to see you know where this takes off. Crypto and blockchain are a massive trend that's transforming the future of technology as we know it. But within this trend itself, we've got lots of other smaller trends that are absolutely explosive like DeFi, NFTs. And in this video, I want to talk about the next big trend that's taking off right now, gaming with crypto and why it's so important and why you need to pay attention. So crypto gaming has caught a lot of people's attention lately because prices of cryptocurrency related to game projects have been on an absolute tear. We've seen massive gains like, you know, uh, 260%, 150%, you know, 100%, 150% across the board. We've seen major companies get into the crypto gaming space like, you know, GameStop entering the metaverse with Web3 gaming job post. We've seen resistance of major Web 2.0 based gaming companies like Steam actually banning Web3 based games from their platform. So all these are signs of a brand new industry with with a, you know, tech trend around this nascent technology that shows huge potential. And the prices of the cryptocurrencies associated with this project is starting to really take off to support this. And now with gaming, I don't think it's just hype. I think there's actually fundamentals underlying this. And I'll talk about that in a minute. Let's actually talk about the prices and what they can do for this overall trend to kind of push the momentum forward, okay? So, like I was saying, gaming cryptos have seen a huge increase over the past, you know, couple weeks. And so this is playing out like a pattern that I've seen happen many times in the crypto space, you know, first with decentralized finance or DeFi back in 2020. We've seen it with NFTs, you know, late part of 2020, early part of 2021. And now with gaming, where what happens is we see a spike in prices associated with this project, which I think is initially fueled by fundamentals and future value potential. We'll talk about that here in a second. But as this price actually spikes like this, it becomes massive marketing for this entire sector that has a snowball effect. So what do I mean by that? Well, basically, uh, cryptocurrency prices are the best marketing for anything blockchain related. So anytime, you know, Bitcoin reaches an all-time high, 
Overall interest in anything blockchain related to absolutely explodes. It happens with, you know, search engine volume. I can see my YouTube analytics, et cetera, et cetera. And so that applies to every other small trend. So when DeFi blew up, it was like, you know, the prices went up. Everybody wants to know what DeFi technology is about, right? And then that actually captures users and, and keeps them long term. Same thing with NFTs. And now we're seeing it with gaming. So as these gaming prices have exploded, uh, that can bring a lot more attention to this space. We're probably going to buy into gaming for that reason. More people start playing blockchain games for that reason. And this has a snowball effect, which can really make this trend get bigger over time. And now that's sort of this initial flash that can sound the alarm. But let's talk about the fundamentals, because the fundamentals are actually what gives this trend staying power over the long term and actually helps uh, spike this. Okay, so the fundamentals about what you can do with gaming now and also the future value potential based on the fundamentals that are in place and what can be accomplished. So in order for, you know, gaming to have uh, this initial spike in prices like this, it could be all hype or it could there could be some true fundamentals here like, like I'm talking about. So what are they? Well, first of all, it's the value proposition of what you can do with crypto games in the first place compared to uh, regular types of games that don't involve blockchain in any way. Well, what are they? Well, some of the unique value propositions of Web3 games or crypto games, metaverse games, whatever you want to call them, are that they enable some things like play to earn, for example, where you can actually participate, you know, spend your time in a video game and and get financially get, get financial gain from that. And there's not really great ways where you can do that sustainably with centralized games. Sure, maybe you might be able to build up a character in some sort of game or get some in-game assets and then sell those in a marketplace and get compensated that way. But it's not quite the same as what you can do with some of these play to earn games. And that brings you to the second point, which is actually the ability to take assets from a game and move them out of a game to where they're actually open on the blockchain and can be used, you know, it can be sold, you know, outside of the custody of this game, you could use them, transfer them however you want to, you could actually integrate cryptocurrencies natively into the game. And you could ultimately use these items, you know, in the metaverse in some way. And we'll talk about that here in a minute. So those are some of the fundamentals of blockchain gaming in the first place. They have real solid value proposition right now, and they have a lot of future value potential. And that to me is what's supporting these cryptocurrency prices. Because at the end of the day, the long-term thesis on this channel is always as you create technology that has real benefits to it, that creates demand for the tech itself, you know, as people start using that, insofar as cryptocurrency is integrated to those technologies, you know, in an in inextricable way, the value can actually accrue to the cryptocurrencies themselves because they are an integral part of that system. And so the cryptocurrency value is actually supported by the network effect of the technology itself. In this case, that's what's happening with crypto gaming. And so if you're just brand new to crypto gaming, and you're just checking out the space, and you want to look at some projects and see like, hey, what do they do? Why is this important? Well, I would just start looking at some of the the big ones um, in the space that you can see on a website, like Core Market Cap. You can just go to their gaming section and just browse through it. Okay, and I'll actually just go through a couple of these and you know briefly explain what they do, but you can look into them more to, to, to understand why why this is a big deal. So Axie Infinity is probably one of the top ones because this these this is one of the first projects to successfully crack the play to earn model at scale. Okay, they you know of course they have their cryptocurrency associated with it that's gone up a lot over the past several months. Okay. So Decentraland um, is going to be more powered by like virtual worlds to be more metaverse related. Lots of people are buying digital real estate inside the metaverse with Decentraland. They, of course, have their mana token associated with it. Engine's another big player in this space uh, with gaming for NFTs and actually, you know, uh, game assets for NFTs. There's a lot more on this list. And those are some of the major categories. You can keep going on see other ones like Alluvium, like Play to Earn, uh, Gods Unchained, like a crypto uh, card game. There's D-Race and a lot more. All right, now there's two other reasons why I think that gaming has started to see a huge surge in awareness and also price recently, okay? So uh, the first reason is because, you know, gaming and NFTs are very related topics, okay? So the NFTs are non-fungible tokens. I've seen an explosive uh, run over the past, you know, year or so in crypto. This kind of happens where these smaller sub-trends in crypto that I'm talking about, like DeFi, NFTs, now gaming, they sort of see a hype cycle for a little while, and then that, you know, kind of money and attention flows into something else. Maybe either people internally inside crypto are doing it, or just new people are coming in and out. And then the next thing kind of gets hyped up for a little while. Now, the, it's not all hype, right? There's a lot of fundamentals like I was talking about, but maybe there's these kind of like hypey bubbles that happen. And I think a little bit of that's happening with gaming. I'm not saying all of crypto gaming is going to bubble, but it is under, undergoing some inflated attention. And so NFTs, I think, is one of the reasons, okay? So basically, all that attention that's coming from NFTs is flooding into gaming because they're very closely related. A lot of the, you know, blockchain-based features with gaming is made possible with the NFTs, like the in-game assets, a lot of the play-to-earn functionality as well. And so, you know, a lot of the momentum and capital from NFTs 
NFTs is flowing into crypto gaming. And now another big reason um, I feel that crypto gaming has seen a huge surge in attention lately is what happened with Facebook rebranding. And now another big reason that I think that um, crypto gaming is seeing a, a pretty big surge in activity lately and attention and capital is because uh, gaming is essentially a bridge into the metaverse. And we saw huge news about the metaverse last week with Facebook, the parent company of Facebook in and of itself, the product that you use all the time, is actually rebranding itself to Meta to focus on metaverse goals long term. Now, we saw s- some news about this happen earlier this year. I talked about on this channel how Facebook was talking about rebranding itself to be a metaverse company. Well, it actually happened. And now they've changed their name to Meta and their long-term goal is to focus on Metaverse and all their products underneath it, like Facebook, Oculus, Messenger, Instagram. And they're making a huge bet on this long-term, okay? So I know there's lots of mixed feelings on Facebook and what their place is in Web 3.0. But regardless of how you feel about that, this has been a huge thing that's caught a lot of people's attention. And because blockchain gaming and Metaverse are so closely related, essentially, gaming is a subset of the Metaverse and taking, you know, items in and out of the games into the Metaverse, that is accruing some of that attention as well. And so... With NFTs, with Metaverse, with just crypto in general, all these things are closely related topics to blockchain gaming. And as all these trends rise, it's really an all ships rise type of situation. This is all very positive sum at the end of the day. Pretty much everybody benefits from capital flowing into crypto because it tends to rotate around into these sub trends. And so that's what you need to watch out for. And that's what I think is happening with crypto gaming right now. I think this trend is going to continue on into 2022 and beyond. Before we talk about this trend, let me kind of set this up and tell you why I'm talking about this in the first place. So I just got done watching this uh, talk from Vitalik buterin at ecc this is a big ethereum conference that just wrapped up and in case you're brand new right here and don't know who vitalik is well he's the mastermind behind ethereum itself and so whenever he talks at events like this people pay a lot of attention and are highly influenced by the things that he says here and inside this talk he actually lays out some of the next things that can be built on top of ethereum because of some of the major technological breakthroughs that are happening right now and so i want to give a quick recap of some of the things that he says i'll put a link to this talk down in the comment section below so you can actually watch the entire thing But I'll give you a really brief summary and then really hone in on this trend here. So the whole point of his talk is talking about what we have in blockchain right now is mostly decentralized finance or DeFi, at least built on top of Ethereum. We have cryptocurrencies and then we have things that you can do on top of that with cryptocurrencies like trade them with decentralized exchanges, use them inside of other DeFi apps for like yield farming, you know, earn high APYs that you can't get inside your bank account. And he says all these things are great, but we want to look beyond that to find the next things that we can do with Ethereum itself. And so he lays out several different ideas for what we can do beyond decentralized finance. But the number one thing that stood out to me from his talk that I think we're going to see a lot of traction from is actually going to be decentralized social media or Web3 based social media. And so let's talk about why. Well, first, let's look at basically what blockchains are good at compared to, you know, alternative ways of doing things. And let's look at how we can actually improve social media with blockchain. So I'm actually going to borrow some ideas from Vitalik's talk here. Again, the link's down in the description below if you want to watch the entire thing. So full credit there. But he says that basically people use DeFi for two primary reasons in the first place. You know, number one, finance is the area where a lot of centralization, you really feel the pain of it. That's where it kind of sucks the most. For example, if you want to go wire funds at a bank, it takes like forever to do that. You actually have to go into the physical location. You have to wait for the wire to settle. But with blockchain, you can just send money basically instantly. And so DeFi really solves this pain point. There's lots of other things DeFi does well. And one of the reasons that DeFi works right now with Ethereum as it is, you know, warts and all being kind of slow and kind of expensive to use is people are still willing to use it because they're making money with it, right? They're willing to pay transaction fees on top of the Ethereum network because they're, you know, getting a high return on tokens that they're trading or farms that they're entering and leaving. They're making money with it. So they're willing to spend money to make money. And it's a natural fit because finance is a pay to play system. But right now, if you were to build, you know, a social network on top of Ethereum, it wouldn't necessarily work as well. You all these benefits wouldn't necessarily transfer over. But since Ethereum is actually making a lot of changes in the coming months to improve its transaction fee issue, then new use cases are emerging and the fact that it's making this transition can actually make it more viable to create a web three based social network. And that's because, you know, as layer two scaling solutions go online, transactions are going to become cheaper. And as Ethereum aggression proof of work, proof of stake, and then sharding gets turned on as well, then we can also improve that scalability problem with those improvements. But once those technical barriers are crossed, you know, why would you use a decentralized social media or a blockchain based social media platform as opposed to a centralized one? Well, like Vitalik says in his talk, basically, there's a pretty widespread understanding that social media as we see it today 
kind of sucks. Or there's some major problems and then we need better ones. So what are some of these problems? Well, number one is censorship or manipulation. Basically, social media has the ability to hide things they don't like or promote things that they do like and also the ability to completely ban users from their platform. And I think more and more users are becoming aware of this and desiring in some sort of alternative. And the other reasons that he laid out are like low quality discourse. So how many times do you see like a really high value social media post put out there and then it has all these like terrible comments? Maybe it's just like spam or scam scammers or just really low quality discourse. And then the last one is basically uh, engagement misaligned with quality. That's what he says in the video. Basically, the idea is that you, social media platforms incentivize people to click on things that aren't necessarily the highest quality. They just get attention and therefore they get shown the most. All right, so let's talk about some of these benefits that he proposes in here and how blockchain can make this better with social media. So let's start with the idea of censorship. So let's talk about like outright censorship, like somebody saying, oh, I'm not going to show your post or basically you know, I just want to ban somebody from a platform altogether. Well, of course, with blockchain, anytime you put new information on the blockchain, it's there forever. So this has pros and cons for sure. But let's talk about these one by one. So number one, basically, if you were to write, you know, new social media posts, or maybe your account or something like that to the blockchain in a way that did not have any center central control, then nobody could ever censor your posts. And nobody could ever, you know, kill your account. Now, that's a big benefit of blockchain technology, but some people might say, well, hey, there's still a drawback to that because what if somebody, you know, put some information out there that they don't want the world to see, or maybe there's certain kinds of content that you don't want to personally see in your social media app. Even if it's written on blockchain, like it just got put there and there's still a benefit from somebody censoring it out so that you can't see it. Well, you can actually fix this problem by separating apps from protocols. So what do I mean by that? So if you were to separate your app out into two parts, you could create a decentralized social media protocol, essentially, where you put all the information for the social media platform inside of like smart contracts on a blockchain. Not all data belongs in the blockchain, but the central part of the application, the real censorship resistant important part could exist on top of the blockchain itself with smart contracts. And then you could have an application that talks to this protocol protocol. And then maybe this is where some censorship features could come into play. So essentially anything that gets written to the protocol on the blockchain itself can't be censored. But maybe you have an application where, you know, either you just let somebody curate what you can and can't see, you, you, you add some level of trust for them to do that. Or maybe you can have some sort of settings inside your application that control what you can and can't see. Okay. And how this could actually produce a better outcome is you could have competition between app developers that hook into these protocols. Okay. So you don't have to fully trust one app developer to read everything from the protocol and maybe censoring it, or maybe you don't like the censorship features of one versus the other, you could always switch app providers, okay? And if there's enough dissatisfied users, you wouldn't lose the network effect of the social media application itself because it's there in the protocol. You're just getting to choose which application you read from the protocol with. So in short, this protocol could be neutral, but the app could be somewhat opinionated. And this same design principle could enhance other drawbacks of social media. So, you know, in addition to censorship, there are problems with the almighty algorithm, you know, like the YouTube algorithm, the Twitter algorithm, whatever it is, there are two big complaints by this. No, number one, they'll surface posts that get the most engagement, but, you know, the most engagement isn't always the highest quality. That's one of the critiques that Vitalik makes in the video. And number two with the algorithms is they could essentially surface ideas or topics that they personally favor and suppress ideas maybe that they don't like or even individual users. So let's say you're on a social media website like this, like Twitter, for example, then you as a user can kind of get censor, maybe your posts get shadow banned and maybe they don't get shown to as many people for, you know, whatever reason. You could just be censored, you could be shadow banned. You know, conversely, um, you know, you might have something that's really engaging on social media but isn't a high quality, but the algorithm is just surfacing it because it's getting engagement. And similarly over here, you can see the things that are trending. Well, you know, the social media outlet could just decide, well, we're going to make this topic trending because it provides some benefit to our application or our company and we're not going to show certain things that don't benefit the values that we have. So you can solve a lot of those problems like I was talking about here with, with where you have a protocol separate from applications and there can be competition among applications that read for the same protocol. Maybe at the app level, you know, you have different ways that algorithms are implemented, or maybe you have applications that don't actually use an algorithm. They show everything in a linear fashion, or that there's competition between the app makers to determine what, you know, shows up in an algorithm in the first place. It's just less and less risk of, you know, certain ideas or people being promoted or suppressed when you have this separation of concerns. And there are other things that you can add into social media to change how the incentives work 
and, you know, try to filter the quality of what actually gets created on the network itself. So one idea that Vitalik talks about in the video is actually using prediction markets to incentivize content that's there for the long term rather than short term. OK, so right. A lot of times in social media, you'll see, you know, content that gets a lot of engagement really fast, but doesn't necessarily have long term value. And then social media just kind of gets piled together and flooded with content that's only relevant for the moment and not the long term. But he actually talks about how you can introduce prediction markets into this equation to try to incentivize social media posts that do have this staying power rather than this really you know short flash in the pan relevance. And another way he talks about this is potentially integrating decentralized autonomous organizations or DAOs into social media, where you could curate who's you know posting in a certain community or in a circle based upon membership of that DAO, which in many cases would probably just be token ownership. And the last major thing that you could do with these social media platforms is actually introducing other economic incentives with cryptocurrency into these social media platforms. All right, so those are some ideas on how, you know, blockchain can actually improve social media and why this could be another big trend coming down the pike for this entire space, particularly for Ethereum. You know, these are some of the points that Vitalik laid out inside of his talk at ETHCC. Again, I'll put a link to that down in the comment section below or in the description so that you can watch that. I've drawn pretty liberally from that talk, so full credit where credit is due. But there's a lot of use cases for blockchain beyond decentralized finance or DeFi that we're using right now. And a lot of these use cases are being made possible because of the advancements in blockchain technology that are specific to this moment in time, specifically layer two scaling and the move to, you know, Ethereum 2.0. It's going to make all this stuff a lot faster, a lot cheaper, way more scalable for mass adoption, which is ultimately what social media needs in order for any, you know, blockchain based social media network to to do what it's supposed to. Web 3.0 powered by blockchain technology has massive potential to change the future of technology as we know it. This is self-evident if you've actually sat down and gotten your hands dirty and tried out any of these applications yourself. But as you've done this, you know, you might be thinking, hey, some of this stuff doesn't really feel quite ready for prime time. And you're right. But the good news is uh, there's a path forward where we can actually get this technology ready for prime time so that it can scale to billions of users and beyond to actually compete with Web 2.0 giants today. All right, so let's talk about the future of blockchain technology and how it can actually scale to accommodate the billions of users that it inevitably needs to onboard if this technology is going to reach mass adoption. Well, a lot of the limitations around blockchain technology right now are actually just technical in nature. There are problems that have to be you know, improved in order for this to happen. And I'm going to break down how that's going to work in this video. So I'm going to draw pretty heavily from this article here called The Lay of the Modular Blockchain Land. Okay, this is actually by, I hope I'm saying this right, Paulinia. So I follow this person online. Uh, I just hope I'm saying the name right. They're a really great thinker and communicator in this space to explain this problem. So I want to draw pretty heavily from the article. I'll put the link down in the description below for full credit. So in essence, what is the future of modular blockchains? Because this is really the key to understanding how this technology scales to billions of users over the long term. Well, let's look at how that's different from how blockchains work right now. So let's first start off with what, you know, blockchains even do in the first place, okay? So let's say that you're just using a blockchain to do basic tasks like send cryptocurrency around and use smart contracts, maybe buy an NFT, do DeFi, okay? Well, this blockchain essentially has three different properties or three different jobs, okay? Execution, so, you know, whenever you send that cryptocurrency or maybe you buy that NFT, you're executing a transaction. The blockchain actually has to process this. That's the execution part. There's the security part. So it has to make sure that the transaction is secure. It doesn't fail in some way. That your funds on the blockchain network itself can't be compromised. That nobody can you know, change the state. And also with data availability, basically, can they accurately read your balance? Can they accurately reproduce, you know, the entire history of the chain and do it quickly so that you can use it in other applications? So all these are things are the main jobs of a blockchain. But one thing that we've come to find over time, and people have known this for quite some time, but uh, it's very clear now, which is any individual blockchain in and of itself is pretty bad at doing all these things really well. So why is that? Well, it comes down to the scalability trilemma, okay? And, and the whole idea that any one blockchain uh, doing this poorly is evidence of what's wrong with a monolithic blockchain future as opposed to a modular blockchain future, which is really what this video is about. Okay. Here's why a monolithic blockchain design is, you know, won't, won't scale to billions of users. So basically it has to do with the scalability trilemma. Anytime you're creating a blockchain, you're at tension with three different things, scalability, security, and decentralization. Okay. So typically you have to basically pick two or optimize for two in order to create a monolithic blockchain that does what you want it to do. So 
basically, if you it, you can't really have your cake and eat it too. So you can't really have a super fast blockchain that's also secure and decentralized. You're always trading off between one of these two things to get the other. So in a case of a blockchain like Ethereum, for example, you know, it is uh, very secure and very decentralized, but it's not as scalable. You might have those high transaction fees. The transactions aren't very fast. Same thing is true for Bitcoin because they highly value the security and decentralization. And you'll see other, you know, chains that advertise really high transactions per second or cheap transaction fees, but they typically make compromises in security or decentralization. And so how do you get the best trade off of all these worlds. Like at the end of the day, for the technology to actually scale to billions of users, it needs this scalability vector. And it also needs the security and it's also needs decentralization. So how you do this is not with monolithic blockchain designs for the long term, but it's actually modular blockchains. And that's really what the future is about. So let me explain how this works. So essentially, what you do is you take all these different responsibilities of blockchain, execution, security, and data availability, and you build them into different modules, okay? And you actually delegate these responsibilities to different modules and you specialize. I mean, just, just it's a common pattern throughout lots of different things that, you know, specialization is the key to the best outcome for everybody long-term. You see it in economics, you see it in other aspects of computing, you see it in the, you know, business, whatever. So how would you do that with blockchain? Okay, so basically you take execution and you put it in one environment, you take security and put it in one environment and data availability also in a different environment as well. Or you, you take the area or said a different way, you take the places where you get the best security and decentralization and you stick them in one environment and you take the place where you get uh, the best execution is taking an environment and then you combine the best the strengths of all worlds together to get the best end result. So let's look and see how that works. So let's start off with the execution layer, because like I was saying before, the execution layer is essentially the, the part of the blockchain that, that users interact with. You can think about it as the consumer facing layer. So if you're going to go send cryptocurrency in your MetaMask wallet from one account to another, then you would do it there. If you're going to buy an NFT, send the NFT to DeFi, you're interacting with this execution layer. So in a modular blockchain future, this execution environment is essentially moving to what's called layer two scaling solutions, okay? So this creates a separate environment where you can get this uh, increased scalability at this execution layer, but you're actually dependent upon a layer one base blockchain where you get this security and you know decentralization and also this data availability. It just depends on the pattern. There, we'll look at some differences here in a minute. But some of those popular layer two scaling solutions for for general purpose, uh, you know, programming and, and developing of applications is like uh, op uh, optimistic rollups. We see that with optimism and Arbitrum and also uh, zero knowledge based scaling solutions like zk sync. We also have some application specific ones, but I want to focus primarily on general purpose uh, scaling solutions that any developer can like take an application and move over to, because I think these will be some of the most important ones for, you know, just decentralized mass adoption long term. And now different layer two scaling solutions make, you know, different trade offs and have you know varying degrees of data availability and security. But the good news is that both security and data availability can be obtained from this base layer, Ethereum. Uh, now and also more so in the future. Okay, so let's actually look to see how that works. So I'm actually going to pull a quote directly from the article here when he talks about security of this modular blockchain future, which is basically, this is by far the hardest layer. So at this time, there are only two solutions that are adequately secure and decentralized or even attempt to be. Uh, that's Bitcoin and Ethereum. So most other chains don't see the blockchain Lego tsunami approaching and make crippling sacrifices to security and or decentralization to achieve higher scalability. They're basically talking about taking these layer one blockchains and just making some changes that aren't the best change for the long run, embedding on a mod like a monolithic blockchain future, but he's saying that's the wrong approach, that we have this modular blockchain future, and this is the better way. And so to back this up, he says, so what will it take to compete with an Ethereum security layer? A wide token distribution that can only be achieved from six years of intense activity and high inflation proof of work. So he's talking about the fact that Ethereum, the Ether, the asset itself, has been circulating live for over six years. It's had time to change hands and actually decentralize the entire supply. It's not just doesn't have like, you know, some massive, uh, you know, concentration of holders um, with like VCs or anything like that. So a consensus mechanism, which can handle millions of validators without resorting to in protocol delegations. So what he's saying is basically not having delegated proof of stake, but actually doing proof of stake where you have to run a validator and basically a culture of users and developers running full nodes, focusing on solutions like statelessness to make this sustainable long term. So those are all the things that up, you know, 
help Ethereum security and decentralization. And also that's how it's going to work with the modular blockchain future. And those are all going to happen on the base layer at this time. Ethereum is the best choice for smart contract platform that's going to preserve that with this grand vision in mind. All right, so the last piece of the puzzle is data availability. Okay, so Ethereum, there, there are a couple of ways to accomplish this. There are certain layer two scaling solutions that have better data availability than others, okay? But a lot of that's not going to matter as much in the long term with Ethereum because the data availability Sorry, the data availability is going to get a lot better when sharding comes into play. Okay, so one thing you have to understand is the layer two scaling solutions are not necessarily part of the Ethereum 2.0 roadmap long term. You might have heard of Ethereum 2.0. This is a new improved version of Ethereum. If you're using Ethereum today, you're using Ethereum 1.0. Okay, but in the future, we'll have Ethereum 2.0. All right, where it's where it's um, we get a lot of improvements, right? But the transaction speeds are not really like Ethereum 2.0 is not going to in and of itself help us scale the billions of users. We need this modular blockchain future, but we are actually, you know, improving that base layer that we're talking about here to make it better with data data availability long-term with uh, the sharding part of Ethereum 2.0 that's coming over the next probably, you know, year and change. So what is that going to do? Well, it's essentially, it's going to break the blockchain up into smaller shards or smaller blockchains. They're all, you know, governed by the central blockchain itself. And so what this does is it makes Ethereum data availability or the ability to retrieve information reliably and quickly from the blockchain much better because it's breaking this information up into smaller clusters and you don't have to have this responsibility, you know, shared by the entire blockchain. It's taking that modular blockchain, you know, uh, idea down to the actual base layer itself and doing this, you know, delegation, this specialization for data shards in and of themselves uh, with inside this blockchain. But it says in the short term, we have Validiums and Volitions, which can leverage Ethereum security while committing transaction data in compressed form to separate data availability layers. Talking about that, basically in the short term, we can get these benefits from layer two scaling solutions. So with all these three pieces combined, we can actually get the best trade-off that accomplishes all the purposes uh, that a blockchain is supposed to fulfill. So this execution, this security, this data availability by breaking the blockchain up into multiple modules that can, you know, specialize and actually complement one another where each is weak, okay, where one is not as secure, it can, you know, benefit from the security of the other components or the other modules security and where one layer is not as, uh, you know, scalable, not as fast, then it can, you know, glue into the other module to help with that. And this is the future that, in my opinion, is what we want for Web 3.0 to ultimately reach mass adoption and scale to billions of users. Because at the end of the day, if we're actually going to build competitive technology to Web 2.0, it actually needs to be decentralized, okay? We can't just make something that's, you know, decentralized and name only because, you know, nobody really wants to build on that future long term if they truly embody, you know, Web 3.0 values. Because the last thing you want to do is build on something that's, you know, has a massive point of failure of centralization because we see this all the time in the business world now with Web 2.0. And that's, we don't really just want to copy and paste that from, you know, Web 2.0, Web 3.0. And this, in my opinion, is the best way to avoid that and create the long-term vision that we actually want to see here. All right, so I hope you like this free masterclass here on YouTube. Again, bookmark this video, come back to it, you know, rewatch it, share with your friends so they can understand where this whole space is headed. If you like this video, make sure you subscribe to the channel, turn on notifications, like the video. That really helps this video out so the more people can learn about blockchain. And if you're as fast with this technology as I am, you want to get your hands dirty, how can you get started today? You can go to my YouTube homepage. You can find my free courses there. They're like Udemy courses, but they're totally free. And if you like those and you want to take the next step or hey, Maybe you want to take a master shortcut entirely. I actually become a blockchain master step-by-step start to finish over at dappuniversity.com forward slash bootcamp. You don't have to be an expert to get started today. I've helped people with zero coding experience become real-world blockchain developers in a matter of months. So that's all I've got. And until next time, thanks for watching Dapp University.